Okay, so let me start by just uh, presenting what the project is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my screen off or my picture off the screen and I'm going to show you the website. And as I do that, I'll open it up to any questions and try to give you examples. Um, so let me switch views and I'm going to take it over to um, my website. Okay, so here's the website. And it'll explain um, quite a bit about what the project is. Now, I have actually the three parents that are on. Oh, okay, so here's the website. Um, I have, of the parents that are here, I have some of you who are my regular U.S. history and some that are my ACAD history. So I want to make sure I point out the differences on what they're going to be doing because there are some variables that meet the needs of the different kinds of students I'm working with. So let me first of all look at some of the things that are common. So the website is nesthistory.org. You can access it at home, uh, just as I am doing here. You'll always go to the current unit, which is Conflict in the United States, and here's the project. So the assignment for this, I'm going to put my glasses on, is that the students will do history as opposed to talking about history. So in a traditional history course, and this is what we did for the first part of the year, I stood up in front of the class, I lectured, I showed pictures, they went to the textbook. Um, for the new part of the class, I'm now um, going to be turning history over to them. So the kids are researching in depth a subject in U.S. history. Uh, they're taking research notes on the subject that they're, they're teaching, and then they're going to create a project which will support their uh, specialty area, what they've been researching, and then they're going to teach class. That's the nutshell version of what they're doing. As they research this, they are to become the specialists. They're becoming the historians. And then as historians, they're sharing it with their peers. So as they're um, teaching to their peers, their peers will be taking notes. And then after they're done teaching, I take over and I'll kind of support what the kids have been teaching. So that's the nutshell version. Now I've got some dates that are on the website. Um, here's a quick version of it that gives them views of the dates and deadlines. Uh, the kids are receiving in class uh, this hound out here. They got it day one, but I know a lot of them lost them because I picked them up off the floor. This tells them what is the assignment and what are the due dates for each of the parts of the project. So it talks about what is your source sheet, how many sources do you need to have, how many um, research notes do you need to have, what is your research notebook, what does your project need to entail, uh, what is the or oral presentation, what does it need to entail, and what is your historical novel. So this is just a quick reference sheet that the kids have. Look for that at home as well, but you can find it right here on the website too because it's right there for you to see. So now before I start going through the details and explaining things, do I have any questions from any of you? Come back over here so I can see if I have any questions from you. Okay, great. So let me show you, first of all, one of the questions that's come up is, how does my son or daughter know when they're doing their presentation? Well, first of all, let me back up. What is my son or daughter's presentation? The day that we gave this presentation, or that we assigned the presentation, the kids were given a number as they came into class. It's the fairest way I know how to do it, which I know is difficult, but the kids could choose from a list, and then they signed up for their presentation. And the screen right here shows you what presentation they signed up for. So you can see here by class who's doing what presentation. Okay, so there's their... Okay, now here's someone there in the background. Do they have a question? Yeah, I can hear that as well. I'm looking at your text. Yeah, Jason, we're going to mute you for a few minutes. Don't take it personal. Hopefully, we can still hear you as we do that. So let me go back in here and mute you. Yeah, that's not the screen we want. Okay. That'll help a little bit. Okay, let me go back to the screen. So now that the students have chosen what their presentation is going to be on, um, they then had to determine what the date was. So the way they determined the date uh, for their presentation, they came 
to the calendar, the class calendar, which is on the main page of the website. So here's the class calendar. Um, this has every lesson that we're doing until the end of the year. So you find what your child's presentation is, or your son or daughter's presentation, and then you look to see what the date is. So if they had presentation one, they're teaching on February 10th. If they had presentation 5 and 9, they have the 25th. You'll notice most days only have one presentation. Um, but there are a couple where we had to double up because we're just pressing to get so much done this year. Um, and this, if you look at the calendar, it just shows each of the numbers when they're presenting. So that's how, um, when they'll be doing their presentation. It's based on the school calendar that you have here. Okay, um, let me go get out of the calendar. Uh, go back to the conflict unit. So that's when they're doing their presentation and what their presentation is. Now their presentation is going to consist of um, starting their research. So the first thing they did after they selected their subject is they had to create a research notebook and begin researching their topic um, in the library and on the internet and with films and with um, texts and f and uh, magazines, all of the things that we're making available for him, at, for them here and at home. So for that research notebook, and every one of the students have done this, um, they went in and they created a notebook that they shared in Google Docs with me. So I can access everyone's notebook right now. And I pulled up a couple just a couple of minutes ago, so I'd have these to show you. Um, so here's one, here's a second one. No, no, that's a, a source sheet. So they put their subject at the top, then they took their essential questions, these focus questions, to help them focus their research. And then they answer the question. Now let me show you where these research questions are at. And again, each of your students have created this. They found their research questions under their topic. So if their topic were rebellion, or let's actually choose one of you whose, whose parents I have here. Let's see. I know I have... Looking down to see if I can see. Here we go. Here's one. Key leaders of the revolution. So this was their main topic right here. These were their focus questions. These are the questions that they're researching so they can answer their question. So they typed those questions over here in their research notebook. And then in the library, they've been researching these questions. So our librarian has purchased for us over 3,000 books, which are specific to the subjects that they're researching. And so in the library they go in, they pull up all these books, she has them on cards for us, and they can start answering the questions. As they're researching in their research notebook, so here this gal has paraphrased what was the role of the Continental Army, she's paraphrased an answer, and then she's saying right here at the bottom, you can see the area that's highlighted, she's doing just a quick end note, what book did she get that from? And then they also created on day one, or day two actually, a source sheet. The source sheet looks like this, and the source sheet gives me their references. Where are they getting this stuff? So these are the, the books that she's going to that she's using in doing her research so far. And she hasn't got internet sites. This young man has used quite a bit of internet sites, which is what I why I brought his up, because he's used more of the internet. Um, so they're using those different sources to find their information. They answer their questions here, short end note, and over here in their source sheet, they're sourcing. So I'm trying to show them beyond being a historian, how do you do research? How do you do end notes? How do you do footnotes? We're going to eventually turn this into a works cited page, so a brief uh, bibliography of what they're doing. So that's the research part of the project. It's based on a specific area of research that they have chosen from this list. So in the research part, so here's our list of all the areas. In the research part, again, they created a research notebook. They researched that information. They sourced that information in their source sheet. And if at any point they forget how much research they have, so their research, inf research notebook, let's come back over here to one of them, is to be 14 pages typed double-spaced, which I know seems kind of like a big task, but if you look at this one in front of you here, you can see a lot of this is just questions. So here's her page one. If you look at that, the top is her main topic. 
Then she is Times New Roman 12 font, that's standard. Then there's the questions, here's her answers. Questions, answers, and because it's typed double spaced, you end up really with seven pages. And that doesn't even include the questions, which can in themselves take two to three pages. I actually just got an email this evening as I was working at my computer. I've been sitting here the entire time. Again, I'm so sorry I was late for you. It didn't sh show me that you were showing up. Um, but I just had a student email me and say, can I take more than 14 pages of notes? I've already got 13 pages and I've got more stuff to, to answer. And of course they can. I have, you know, I'm not going to punish them for excelling. But that's the research phase. On their source sheet, they have to gather 14 sources. And sometimes the source will just simply be sourcing a picture that they've put into their notes. So I have a number of students who've actually, in their research notebook, they've put down pictures or maps or graphs that they're going to use in their presentation. So they'll need to source those here. And that's totally fine. So that's the research and sourcing part of the project. Now I'm going to leave this page for a minute to see if any of you have questions. Then I'm going to go to the presentation and the project part. So I'm going to leave here real quick and see if any of you have any questions about the research. Okay, so one of the questions that just come up is, can students work on their research um, outside, oops, let me get rid of that, um, outside of school? Definitely. I, mean, I have no problem with that. In fact, I have a lot of kids, like I say, I was on just a minute ago, and I noticed that there were over five kids currently working on their Google Docs at home. So that's perfect if they're working at home. Okay, good. The question we should just ask, do I require a balance in sources? Meaning, can they pull them all from one source or one type of source? So can they pull them all from Wikipedia or can they pull them all from the internet? That's an excellent question. They actually need to gather at least seven textual sources. And one of the things I've told the kids is they'll say, well, you know, I already know about Lexington and Concord. I said, that's great. What you're looking for, since you're, you're being a historian, you have to find a supporting source. So maybe you're using Wikipedia and you found something in Wikipedia. You're also going to need to find that in a textbook and source it in both places, even though it may be similar information. But you're getting a backup for what, you, what you've created. Okay, one of the questions was it just asked, can, you, can they use any source or just the ones provided in class? They can use any source related to their subject. So in class, what we've provided them is obviously the textbooks. And like I say, the, the librarian has gathered thousands of textbooks specifically to um, help these kids with their project. And so we are using those textbooks. They can also use the just textbook we have for the class um, and the um, internet. I've also added, and I just changed screens if you noticed here, for each of the specialty areas, I've gone through and um, looked up internet sources. Let's see if I can get to them right here. So I've put in internet sources that I've checked and I know are very good internet sources that are related to each of their focus questions. So they can use those sources you see here, these like different internet ones here. Um, student presentations, they can source other students who've taught in previous years. And for every one of the projects I put on student work, uh, the textbooks, the books in the library, or anything you have at home. So if you want to take your son or daughter um, to the library and let them work on it in the library or at home or whatever, that's totally fine. In fact, I, I really appreciate the support. Okay, any other questions about the research or source portion? Okay, so the questions just come up, are all projects due on the same day? Well, let me go uh, talk about the projects versus the research. So the research and source sheet are all due on the same day. So that part, um, the research and, and um, source notes are all due on the same day because we can all get them done on the same day. So let me go back and talk about the project and then we can talk about due dates. So project and presentation. I'm going to leave this page again and go back uh, excuse me, go back to the screen so I can show you that. Okay, so let me go to the calendar. Let's go back one. Nope, that's going to be two. Okay, so the calendar that you see here um, shows that presentations are on different days. So for example, the students who had specialty area one and two, so one is 
um, conflict in the colonies prior to the Revolutionary War, and number two um, is, I believe, the French and Indian War. And that's just going off the top of my head. Whoever has Special Area 1 and 2 will be presenting their information on the 10th, which means they are presenting in 15 days. Conversely, if, that, if someone had uh, something dealing with the Civil War, they won't be presenting until May 17th, because that's when we're doing the Civil War, which makes it kind of tough, because that means, and, and I recognize this is tough, some kids are presenting, they, they had from the moment it was presented to them, so this was presented on um, the first day of this term, so that was January 13th. So they have from January 13th to February 10th to do their research and write their project, whereas I recognize other students have four months to do their presentation and write their project. Let me explain why, and then we can kind of discuss some of the conflict that might arise from that. The reason I'm doing it that way is when the students present, so in the, the regular ed classes, the students will present a 20-minute presentation on their subject. In the course of that presentation, they will share a project they've created to support their subject. Then after, in the regular ed classes, after they've taught, I will teach a 50-minute or 55-minute lecture or do some kind of supportive activity that will support what they've taught. So if the student's doing uh, the French and Indian War after they're done, um, I'm going to do a lecture on the French and Indian War. And while the student is teaching, um, students are taking notes from their work. In my ACAD classes, the students will be um, teaching for 40 to 50 minutes. So in the regular ed, it's 20 to 30. So minimum 20, maximum 30. In the regular ed, or in the ACAD, it's 40 to 50 minutes. So they have a longer period of time. The reason they're spread out this way is you simply can't all do them. If, if the presentation is going to have any meaning, any depth, any meat to it, it has to be a long enough presentation to share what they've learned. And you can't all do that on the last month of school. So they're spread out so that we can teach history consecutively, like this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and at the same time they can teach but then I can add material they're missing. So it's spread out that way. I'm aware they have shorter periods. Now I will say this, with one or two exceptions, most of the kids who are going first were the kids that were here first, and they chose to go first because they wanted to be done with it. Because those kids who are going in May, they may have more time, but it's also when all of their big projects are coming in from science and math and foreign language, and that's when they have their music festivals. So these kids who are going at the first have the advantage of being done first. They don't have to worry about it. They can not have to have this on their plate with everything else going on. So let me go to questions and talk about any feelings you have about that, if we can work that out. And then let me talk about what the presentation and project entails and give you some examples. So I'm going to leave this page again, go back to where I can see you to see if you have any questions. I'm going to minimize this here. Okay, so do, do we have any questions on that? See someone typing, so I'm just going to wait for the question to come up. Okay, now one of the parents has said they, they understand the rationale. It just seems unfair to them that some people have less time. I, I actually get that, and I know that's a struggle. It is really the only way to get all of them in. And I guess the flip side is they chose their presentation on arrival in class, so the order they arrove in, uh, arrove? <laughs> that they arrived in the class, and the majority chose to go early because they wanted to be done. Now, kids can, I can't have them switch dates because you can't do the French and Indian War in the middle of the Mexican-American War. You're 150 years off and it doesn't make sense. So. But if a student had wanted to earlier on switch with another kid or another student, they could have done so. At this point, it would be very difficult to do so. But anyway, that's, that's why we're doing it that way. Okay, now having said that, let me talk about what the presentation and project uh, entails. So I'm going to leave this screen again and go back to the website.
Maybe. Ah, pods. There we go. Okay, so the presentation, again, time-wise, for the regular ed students will be a 20 minimum to 30 minute maximum presentation. In the ACAD class, it's a 40 minute to 50 minute presentation. And in fact, I generally find, like students are always like, oh, there's no way I'll be able to talk that long. But having done this now for 10 years, I often have to clip them off and say, okay guys, you only have five minutes. Because these kids come to know this subject really, really well. In fact, I know some of your students, I've already talked to them in class, and they've already started you know, becoming passionate about history. Um, one of your sons, I know, already has 15 pages of notes. So they, they know the subject really well, and they want to teach it. But, they, but I cap them at 20 minutes and then at the, the 50 minutes for the ACAT. So in their presentation, they're teaching, and I'll just go to one of these presentations to show you. They're going to teach those questions right here to their peers. They can teach it to them in a variety of ways. And I'm going to show you some examples because they can select the way they're going to teach it. They just have to teach this information here. So let me show some of them to you. Um, that again comes back, let's go back to one more page, to right here. Here's a list of different types of presentations they can choose from. And in fact, if they wanted to come up with their own kind of list, they could do so. So I've put a website design, music video, timeline, and each of these, if you click on them, brings up a um, rubric for grading it. So if your child wanted to write a short story, this is the rubric for how I'll grade a short story. If um, your son or daughter wanted to make a timeline, this is the rubric for how we will grade or evaluate a timeline. If your son or daughter wanted to make uh, create a website, this is the rubric for how I will grade the, the, the website. If they had some other format that they wanted to come up with, all they need to do is talk with me. Typically I find we can change one of the, um, um, rubrics to match any other kind. So now let me show you some of the presentations that have been done in the past, um, because I think it will help you get a feel for what they might look like. So I, I will, as the kids are teaching, I will take some of the very best presentations. I record them, and that's why at the very first of the year when you guys did, uh, when, when the parents signed the disclosure document, I asked you, are you okay if I publish your student's work? And again, before I publish anything your son or daughter has done, I will send another message out to you just to make sure that you're comfortable with that. But I have published previous year's works on each of the specialty area. So this specialty area one, which is conflict in the colonies prior to the Revolutionary War, has a couple of examples of student work that can kind of show us exam uh, examples of what they could do. Here's a website that a student created on the French and Indian War. So this student had that subject. They made the website. I think they, yeah, they used Weebly. They've got a summary here. They created a PowerPoint that uh, student could, students can download from there. They did different perspectives on the war. And these questions, like this website here, corresponds to these questions. So her questions are, what are the different perspectives? And she put that into her website. So she could use this while she's teaching in the background, she has this um, web this website that gives her almost a prompt, so she has something to look at. So that's one example of a website. Another example is of someone who's created a video talk show, same one, Era One. Uh, this was a regular ed student who created this with her family. So she dragged her family into this, and her family had to Hello, participate in the activity. Episode of what changed history. Let's give a warm welcome to our ancient guests, Catherine Hayden. Hello. The Queen of England. Hello. Mohana, an Algonquin Indian. 
That is a nice mom. I don't know that I'd do that for my son or daughter's presentation. Okay, so there's one example of a talk show, and if your son or daughter is one that's going to be really uncomfortable standing up in front of their peers, this is something they can create in advance and then show that and we watch that. Um, another example is something they could create in advance um, that doesn't require them to stand up in front of their peers for a long period of time is a, stor a storybook. And if memory serves me right, I have an example of that in era two. So let me look here. Yeah. So this storybook, um, one of the students wrote about why the Revolutionary War started. The book um, goes right along. So the, the children's storybook that she wrote goes right along with these questions that she had to address. And in this case, she didn't want to get up and talk in front of her peers, so she came in advance, and we recorded her on, on my audio camera telling the story, and then we showed the story so they could see the pictures um, a little bit better than her just standing in front of the class. So that's another option for somebody who may not feel really comfortable um, just standing up in front of their peers without any kind of prompts. Um, so that's a storybook. I showed you a website. Uh, I showed you a video talk show. Oh, oh, another thing that a lot of kids like, because they like participating in, in them, is a reader's theater. And this is one that was created, I think, last year. And this student wrote the reader's theater and then had her peers participate in it. So she asked them in advance if they would be willing to come in and do this play. So she wrote this play right here, and the kids came in and did the play. So it was a lot of fun. They just kind of each took parts and did it in front of the class. They didn't dress up or anything, but that's a reader's theater. And that's an example of something you could do without having to stand up and, you know, really show off to other people. Uh, you can make a game. So on era, almost every one of these have games in them. Oh, I've got a message here. Let me, let me get to that question real quick. So the question was asked, did it take the full 20 minutes to do the reader's theater? No, it didn't. In this case, that reader's theater took maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then that last 10 or 15 minutes in that case, she got up and answered her questions. The storybook that the, the young lady wrote, it took the majority of her 20 minutes, so that she didn't have to add any additional time. So you c could choose a project that the presentation of your project, like doing the movie or um, writing a storybook or writing a reader's theater, takes the entire 20 minutes, or what most of my students have chosen to do is to do a project that they can present in 10 minutes and then stand up and present the rest of their information in 10 minutes or put the rest of the information on a, a web slide or um, a web page or make a newspaper. And you could print a newspaper and bring it into each of the students and say, okay, here's a newspaper from 1860 that addresses the focus questions. So you can mix and match things for those students who may be uncomfortable standing up in, in front of their peers. So I'm going to see if I have any more questions coming up. Oh, great. Thank you, Kindreds. That's good to know who you are. <laughs> okay. Um, let me give you just a couple more examples of types of presentations they can do. And then I want to go back and see if there's any other questions, show you the rubrics for how I'm going to, to grade it, and make sure that everybody feels comfortable and, you know, if there's something we need to worry about. Um, we can address it right now. The most common form of presentation, frankly, is students choose to do, um, they do a short lecture with a supporting PowerPoint, and then they'll do a video talk show. So, or not, excuse me, a, a game. So they'll do a PowerPoint and then a game. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of those. Um, what am I? I'm, I'm in era three. Let me, let me go to error one, and I've got an example there where this student um, created a timeline, and they did an online timeline, and then they came in. So this is the first part where he just made an online timeline, or a musical timeline.
And then he used that to come in and, and actually teach the class. So this is of him coming in and he stood up in front of this and used it to kind of guide his lecture. So a lot of that kind of thing happens. A lot of... Where's he at? He must have moved out of the way here. Let's get him back on the screen. There you go. So here he's in front of the class just lecturing, and a lot of kids will use that as a prompt. Um, games are totally fine and appropriate. A lot of kids have done those. They can make, um, I think on one of the westward movement activities in here, and again, there's so many different ones, I can't show them all to you. There's probably 40 different presentations here for kids to see. But somewhere in here, on one of the westward ones, someone made a uh, board game that was somewhat like Ticket to Ride, if you've ever played that game, on Westward Expansion, and we played the game for 10 minutes as a class. We broke into teams and played it. So lots of different things they can do. Now I'm going to leave this screen and go back and see where we're at, um, and if we have any additional questions I need to answer. Okay, so do I have any additional questions? See some typing coming up. Oh, and while you're typing the question, one of you asked the question, do they just stand up front and talk for 20 minutes? Students can use notes. They can't just read notes, but they can have note prompts. And another thing that helps a lot of the kids is making a PowerPoint that has notes so they can kind of glance back and forth there to help them. Okay, another question is, do they have to use technology? No, they don't have to. So like my kids, um, one of the presentations I didn't show is a game that some kids made where they had a big piece of cardstock, and behind it they put tissue, you know, like wrapping paper tissue, and you punch through the card, and once you punch through the little hole, there was a little card that came out, and they played a game with the class that way. Can my son do a game show in class? Yeah, that sounds a lot of fun. Teach the content and then do a game show with it would be totally appropriate. Oh, okay, one of the questions is, do I have a way you can see how it's going to be graded? I do. If you go back to the website, I'm sorry, I wish there were a better way for me not to have to go back and forth for you guys. I know that's a pain. There are rubrics for each piece of um, the, the project. So here is the rubric for the research notebook and source sheet. And in fact, the ACAD kids have copies of, like hard copies of this in their blue book. The regular ed students haven't received copies of these rubrics yet because they didn't want the blue book shape. They wanted to wait. They just thought it would be more stuff to hold on to. But here's a copy of the research notebook um, and the source sheet rubric. So it says how each piece will be graded, what mastery is, what, you know, what, what do I need for their sources, how many they need, etc. So that's the uh, research notebook. There's a rubric in here for the presentation. So here's the rubric for the oral presentation. And this shows how I'm going to grade the presentation, um, the project. That's in that rubric as well. So there are rubrics for each piece of them. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, oh, one other piece, which I'm, I totally spaced when we were talking about this here. All of what they're doing so far is, you know, the research and um, writing, collecting sources, doing their presentation in front of the class. There's one other piece, and this comes in at the very end of the year. They can start now, but it's not due for a very long time, um, which is an advantage, again, those who go first have, because they get this out of the way, and then they can focus on this last piece. In the course of their research, so sometime over the next four months, they need to choose dependent on their specialty area. So if I had specialty area one, there's a list of historical novels that our librarian has collected 
that are specific about this specialty area. So the Calico Captive, outstanding book. If you've ever read uh, The Witch of Blackbird Pond, it's by the same author. Standing in the Light, The Captive Diary of Catherine Carey Logan. This is outstanding, and it's based on a true story. Look to the Hills, The Diary of Losette Moreau, a French slave girl. This is great. And The Last of the Mohicans. That's an advanced reader. But they will choose only for Special Terrier 1, one of these novels. And there are copies of all of these novels in the library. And then, sometime over the course of the next four months, they need to complete, they're going to read that novel, and they're going to create a leaflet about that novel. So they talk about, on each page of the novel, and this is in their blue book as well, so on page one they make a cover sheet, with an illustration for your booklet. On page two, they do about the author. On page three, they say when and where did that novel take place. On page three and four, they do a summary of the novel. Page five, they talk about the protagonists. Uh, page seven and eight, the antagonists. Page nine and ten, they talk about the facts versus fiction in their novel. And page 11 and 12, what are the lessons they learned from that novel. Page 13, their favorite quote from the text. And page 14, did they like the book or not. With that, they're making this layered booklet which there's an example right here. It tells them how to make them right here, and there's a video showing them how to make it right here. We, they, the kids have all signed a contract saying, yes, they read this, they understand what they're doing. But the truth is I spent very little time on this right now because this isn't due until um, May 19th. So that's way far out there. But for those kids who do their presentations in... Uh, next month in February, they can go ahead and and uh, present that, or once they get done with their, their presentation, they can start working on this novel. Okay, I think that's it. I think we've addressed everything. Let me go back, leave this page, and see if there are any questions um, about the novel or any other piece that maybe we didn't do as much. And then, as we have people pull off, if I have anybody who would like to stay on for a little bit, I'm happy to stay on and answer any additional questions that you might have individually that I can just delete from the, the um, vodcast we make of this to share with other people because some things you don't really want to share with anyone else. I see a couple of you typing. I'll see if any questions come up. <laughs> okay, well, I, I still see someone coming through, but for those of you who are wondering, will I actually had eight parents email and say, can you just podcast what you're doing? So when we're done here, I will take this and edit this, pull out anything that's private or anything that includes your name, and I will upload it to the website so that they can see... Um, what it entails. So if, you, if your wife or your son or your daughter or somebody who wasn't here wants to go through it, it'll be on the website. So the website's nesthistory.org. Go to the current unit, and in the current unit, I'll post this. Give me a day or two to go in and edit it, but I'll have it in before the weekend. So if I need to stay in tomorrow night, I'll put it in before I leave for the weekend. And then the next question, okay, i got to put my old lady glasses on. At what point do they have to choose their presentation? Can they wait until they've completed their research? Yes and no, <laughs> meaning when they were given their presentation, they completed a contract, and I actually might be easier for me to show you the contract, which means i got to go out of this silly page again. Um, and they shared it with me and with themselves, so they have a copy of this as well. But it's not a binding contract. At any point, if they feel like, you know, as they're getting to know their subject better, they, they want to change what they chose to do for their presentation, they can change it. But when we initially chose their projects, and they read through this page together that we've just kind of been running through right now, they completed this contract right here. And I have these from every student but one in my class. So they typed it out. They said, this is my name, this is my email address. So they got a copy of this as well. The email went to them. Um, this is the date. 
or this is my specialty area that I selected from that list. Here's my main uh, subject that I'm researching. They went to the calendar and said, when is it due? And the hard copy, like their PowerPoint or movie or their game or their diorama, is due the date before the presentation, just so we can make sure everything works. Um, they typed that in there. And then they typed in the date of their presentation. And then they selected some form. There's a drop-down menu. And um, a lot of the kids at the time said, well, I think I want to do a storytelling, but I don't know. Or I want to do a puppet show, but I'm not sure. Or I want to make a trifold poster, I'm not sure. So what I told them is, choose the top two that you think you want to work on. So as you're doing your presentation, you can be gathering material for that. So if you know you're making a poster, you can be gathering pictures, you know, like JPEGs of pictures you can save. So they selected um, a primary and a, an alternate presentation format simply so they could start kind of working out as they were researching. However, I told them if they ever wanted to change it, they just had to come into the contract, send me a new one saying I'm changing this, and if I didn't say no, like if I didn't come back and say I'm sorry, I don't want you to do that kind of presentation, then that would be acceptable because I automatically receive copies of these contracts and so do they. A couple. Um, so one of the questions that come up is, can your son or daughter spend more time on a couple of the questions in depth? Most definitely. So you've got a subject, and these kids will fall in love with their subjects. That's the point of this project. I want them to become historians. I want them to fall in love with the subject and start researching it for themselves instead of just accepting. You know, we, we tend to look at history as a black and white. This happened, then this happened, and this, this happened. And it's just not that simple. Or we'd all be voting for the same presidential candidate. I mean, our different perspectives come into it, and we all view things differently based on how we experienced it. So as they become historians and start researching this, they're going to find some things that they're like, you know, I'm, I'm looking right here at the key leaders of the revolution. This presentation, a lot of people go into this knowing absolutely nothing. Let me pull that back up there if I can. And in the process of doing it, they fall in love with the subject. Or they're like, I had no idea. And this is an example of one because this young lady uh, started doing this, didn't even know who Thomas Paine was. Well, the, by the time she was done, she had, I mean, she'd gathered 25 pages on the guy. She just fell in love with him, found him so intriguing that she went really in depth there. She answered the rest of her questions, but she went really in depth there. And that's great. That's exactly what I want your son or daughter to do. I want them to fall in love with history. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and... Um, and wrap up here, but I'm going to stay online for any questions you have. So I'm going to enable all your mics. And if you have any questions, I'll just go ahead and answer any questions that you individually have. Because I, I want to be whatever help I can to your son or daughter. And you're welcome to send me emails anytime during this process. So um, thanks for coming. I will podcast this, clear it up, get it so that you can all access it. But if you have any other questions, I'm here to help you.